Welcome. Uh, as you can probably tell, I am not Grace. Um, she, her flight, I think, was delayed, or she had to get a later one, and so she's only arriving this evening. So if you want to see Grace, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Um, will, will be your best chance. Okay, so uh, my name is Ben Evans. Um, it's very lovely to be back here at JBCN, um, the easiest conference in the world for me to attend because it's in my hometown. So all I have to do is walk here or get a taxi. Um, I work at Red Hat, where I look after, um, well, in theory, observability, but in practice, I think it's more about the long-term health of the JVM and the Java platform and the Java community, you know, because we're in undergoing this huge shift in towards cloud, and so um, I think there are certain table stakes that are necessary for application platforms and languages to, co to be effective and be real first-class citizens in this new cloud-native world. I think observability is a big part of that. I think JFR plays into that as well. And that's some of the themes, just to give you a bit of a preview, that I'm going to be talking about later. Um, very quick slide on my career. Before Red Hat, I worked at New Relic, where I was lead architect for instrumentation. Before that, I spent a bunch of time working in banks. Um, I've always been interested in performance and performance analysis since ooh, 18 years ago when I worked on the Google IPO and was the performance engineer for that. Um, what else is there to say? I founded a company with Martin Verberg, which was acquired by Microsoft a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm interested in performance and financial technology, I guess. My work in the community is also something that I'm vaguely known for. I'm a Java champion, rockstar speaker, etc. Uh, I live here now, but I used to live in London. I spent a lot of time working with the, the London Java community, including helping to found a project that you might have heard of called Adopt Open JDK. New books. My, one of my more recent books was Optimizing Java for O'Reilly and the absolutely very definitely finished and now off to production and coming out hopefully in August, The Well-Grounded Java Developer. Thank you, Jason, um, which, is, uh, which is my new project. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to start off with a very brief introduction of why, what JFR is and why we need it and how it feeds into that, that sort of nebulous topic known as observability that, that I... Uh, mentioned earlier. Then we're going to talk about some usage modes, you know, because my title is I didn't know J, uh, that JFR could do that. So probably about one and a half, I'm guessing, of these four topics are going to be of, uh, of, of the way that people use JFR today. So I want to kind of extend that and show you some other things it can do. Uh, and then finally, we'll just sort of finish off and draw some conclusions and bring a, a thread back to talk about what might, might happen in the future. Okay, so just before we get going, just it's always a good, good straw poll. So who actually uses JFR regularly? Like three people. Okay. Um, who's running Java 17 in production? Okay, that's actually more than I was expecting. Okay. And Java 11? Yeah. Anybody running anything below Java 8? Only one, two persons that are prepared to admit to, to it. Okay, yeah, sure, that's fine. Um, that's interesting. I would suggest to the folks that are on Java 8 that you don't know what you're missing. Um, there is a version of Java Flight Recorder available for Java 8, which I'll talk about, but you really do need to start thinking about upgrading. Um, 8 is really quite nasty these days. After you've used 11 or 17 for any length of time, going back to 8, actually, it feels painful. So you're probably living in a cave and not realizing it. Um, anyhow, I digress. So what's Java Flight Recorder? Okay, it's a profiling tool. It gathers diagnostics, profiling data, data about the JVM. Uh, and it does so while the, J the Java application is running. Uh, it's event-based, so various different subsystems and various different things inside the JVM generate events. And you can, or, or not as you choose, decide to collect those events and do something with them. Um, it's low overhead. Oracle have this number, this sort of headline number, that it's 1%. And uh, do I believe that? Well, like all things, it's, it's one of the, 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 the strangest things about, about performance that people don't always realize right at the start, is it's kind of almost like quantum mechanics. You know, when you, when you have a, you know, a hydrogen atom or something and you, you measure it and you observe it, you disturb it, you change its, its state by the act of observing it. It's the same thing with applications. You have to gather the data. You have to do something with it. You have to decide whether it's important or not. You have to, you know, hopefully, 
exfiltrate it, get it out of the running system and put it somewhere else so you can do something with it. All of that takes resources, especially CPU. So if what you're concerned with is the CPU usage of your application, the more detailed information you get about its CPU usage, the more expensive it is. So trade-offs are at the absolute heart of this. So, so do I believe that it's possible to basically run JFR, turn almost everything off, and get 1% overhead? Yes, I probably do. But the question is, how useful is that really? Uh, in practice, um, when I was working at JClarity with, with Martin, we tended to go with a number more like, hey, does this pointer even show up? Not very well, 3 to 5%. That's, uh, that's much more like the number we, we've seen. And that is acceptable for most use cases. Um, there are, of course, applications in low latency trading and things which actually, actually have latency um, constraints. Most applications don't, by the way. My estimate is that roughly between 95 and 99% of people that talk about the latency constraints in their application, they don't actually have latency constraints. Um, here's, a, here's a tip for you. If you're running on top of a, a, a cloud environment, you probably don't have a latency constraint because there's levels of scheduling going on down at the, the hardware and the machines you actually run on that you can't see. And if you're not sensitive to those, why do you think you have a latency constraint? Just saying. So 3 to 5% is kind of my rule of thumb. Obviously, it depends on your application. You never do this stuff without measuring it. You need to know what your actual constraints are. Uh, but 3 to 5% is a good enough, well, I don't know anything else about your application, so I'm going to guess that that's okay. Uh, and for most cases, that's actually true. What else can we say about JFR? It's hotspot specific. It is deeply integrated into the core of the VM. It is all about um, the way that hotspot is written. Um, so it's not actually that easy to generalize it. You couldn't really make it into a Java standard. Um, but having said that, there are reasons, I guess, probably largely business reasons from Oracle, that they're trying to bring it to Graal VM. And there are folks at Red Hat uh, who are working on, on making sure that, that, that JFR does work with at least some parts of, of, uh, of GraalVM as well. Okay, so it's an internal system. It's got lots of good low-level data. That's basically what we're saying here. So where did it come from? Okay, well, this slide is kind of a bit of a spoiler um, because the thing about JFR is it's changed names several times. Right? It's always been JFR, but what the J stands for has changed. These days, in 2022, it stands for JDK Flight Recorder. Back here in Oracle at Java 7, it stood for Java Flight Recorder. And back in the dawn of time, when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, before Oracle not even acquired uh, Sun, but when they acquired BEA, JFR still existed. That time, it stood for JRocket Flight Recorder. So this thing has been around for 15 years. It is rock solid production quality technology. It is battle tested. But for the first, well, 10 plus years of its life, it was a proprietary technology. It wasn't until the arrival of Java 11 that we actually got an open source JFR. So, because of that, if, if someone was to say, Ben, why, you know, this great technology, why don't more people use it? Well, because for the majority of its life, it has been proprietary tech. These days, I think that, that apart from some of the architectural constraints that I'm going to talk about in a second, there really isn't a good reason not to use JFR. It's an amazing tool. It's so powerful once you know how to drive it. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important and why th I think it has such a, a, good, uh, a good future. Okay, what else can we say? Um, we had the, the Java 7 merge, so, so JRocket comes to Hotspot, becomes Java Flight Recorder, Java 11 shows up. We, we get an open source JFR. Java 14 is interesting because in this time frame, we get a new technology called JFR streaming. Very interesting. Come back to talk about that one. And also at this time, you get the backport to Java 8. So if you're running a modern, up to date Java 8 that's been released in the last couple of years, you have JFR enabled. Or you can have JFR enabled. It's present in your VMs should you wish it to. Um, and then, of course, Java 17 is the first LTS with streaming. Because although it's been around since Java 14, and I've been working on projects that have supported it since Java 14, nobody runs a non-LTS in production. Actually, I didn't ask that question. Let's, let's just get the answer that I th I'm pretty sure. You know, you should never beg the question, but let's, let's see what happens, shall we? Does anyone run non-LTS Java in production? 
No, good, nor should you. So let's talk about where we are today, which is the JDK flight recorder um, in Java 11 or 17, uh, which are the two versions you should be running in production. Um, you can start it in various ways. You can st start it with a command line flag. You can start it dynamically at runtime, so you don't have to, to, to bake in the flags. You can switch it on onto a running process if you want. And you can do that from the command line, as we'll see in a second. And you can also do it via JMX. If you've got the, a JMX server exposed, you can ping it and you can say, start a recording for me, please. Um, notice the language here. We're talking about recordings. We're talking about starting and stopping and this, this thing not being on continuously. Yeah, that's a hint about some of the architectural constraints we're going to face. Fundamentally, when you finish a recording, what you end up with is a file. Uh, it's very nice. It's a high performance, very well, uh, you know, not that difficult to parse binary file, but it's a file. And that is, again, something which is not necessarily great for the sorts of architectures we're going to talk about. Um, what else can we say about it? You can configure the profile. There are 130-ish events in JFR which you can configure on, and some of them are rate limited, and you can control the rate limits. So, for example, you can say, um, I want to know any lock that has been held on, you know, any synchronized lock that has been held on any object monitor for longer than, well, how long do you want it? 10 milliseconds, 20, 5? You choose. So, so not only are there events, but some of them have parameters and are configurable, which means that JFR is extremely flexible in terms of the amount of data and the sorts of things that you can collect on. Uh, if you don't like either of the two default profiles it comes with, I'm sorry, I said default profiles. The profiles are called default and profile. And of them, default is not quite entirely useless, um, but certainly is missing a lot of information that you actually genuinely need. So this goes back to Oracle wanting to have a good number like 1%. Um, also, I don't know who comes up with these names. Default and profile, terrible. Anyway, you can, of course, create your own custom profile should you wish to, and you probably should. So why are we doing all this? Well, cloud native is our reality. Uh, the, a certain APM vendor where I used to work, Uralic, published a report about the state of the Java ecosystem, and in it, they come up with a number something like 70% of apps are containerized. Now, that's not a perfect proxy for cloud native, and the use of New Relic customer data is not a perfect proxy for the entire market, but it's not bad. Gartner's estimate is roughly 1% of all production JVMs are instrumented with New Relic. That is a significant sample of the market, tens of millions of JVMs. It is data that can't be ignored, and it is not self-reported. So that tells us something. It's not conclusive, but it's telling us something. Cloud native is here. People are moving to the cloud. Um, and we have to deal with the world that we find ourselves in, which is complexity of microservice architectures. That's what people are building these days. You know, the old 15-year-old view of the world where you have release cycles that are measured in months, not days. We have monoliths. You know, when I started working at Morgan Stanley, every six months we had a planning exercise where we had to predict how many physical machines that we were going to buy, ship to a data center, and screw into a rack, how many we were going to need in three months' time. Yeah, it's, that world's gone. It's not coming back. Does anyone still have an architecture like this that's prepared to admit it? Nobody, right? It's gone. But that's how we used to do it. And if you want to hear more about what the implications of that are, why the complexity and why the change and why the pace of change is different, I'm giving a two-hour observability workshop on Wednesday, so come along to that. But in one slide, apps are more complex. They have more topology. There's new things with genuinely new behaviors like serverless, uh, Kubernetes, Kafka, stuff like that. And all of that adds up to make environments which are totally different to the ones we've seen before. So for anyone who's not coming on Wednesday, this is a one-slide definition of observability. Um, it's conceptually simple. You collect data. You get it out of the system. Because there's nothing dumber than trying to figure out what's wrong with your system when the data you need to analyze your system is stored in the system, which is broken but you need to figure out why it's broken. There's no solution to that. The only solution is the data that you need to analyze your, sy your system in an outage situation has to go somewhere else. And that somewhere else should be extremely stable and not updated very often. Because if you're updating the system and you're updating the thing which is watching it, chances are sooner or later you're going to break both at once. 
So, you know, this is not rocket science, but that, that pattern, you, you know, the number of times where I have come across people who literally are trying to monitor their system and storing their, their monitoring and observability data in the same damn thing that they're trying to monitor. You know, it makes me cry. Anyway, so you get the data, you put it in a system, and then you can store it and analyze it, and you need a query interface. And this is a quote by a, um, a person called Charity Majors um, who founded Honeycomb. Uh, and, and Charity has got this quote, which I can't quite remember exactly how it goes, but essentially it's along the lines of observability is really about the ability to ask questions you didn't know you had. Because you, you dig into the thing, and if, you, if you're not going in with a preconception, you find that it's actually completely different to what you thought, and you need to, to explore and to expand the, the realm of the data that you're looking at and the questions you're asking. Anyway, come along on Wednesday if you want more. Okay, so how do we, <clears throat> how do we start? JFR. Well, the simplest way is just to give it some flags. The JVM comes up, and it has a bunch of uh, different options here. The start flight recording, you know, and well, we can say a few things. You might give it this option here: duration 200 sex. Okay. Now, what's that going to do? It's going to bring up JFR right at the start, but it's going to do the first 200 seconds of the application. Okay. If you're doing some sort of load test, maybe that's fine. If you're interested in the startup behavior and you know, a bit of steady state and seeing how it reacts when you, when you whack a bit, big load of requests for it, great. It's not really a continuous solution, though, is it? No. Um, you might also do something like this. Have a max size or a max age. Now, these two flags are interesting because what they do is they tell the, J, the, the JVM to enter continuous mode. What it sets is it sets a buffer. And the buffer is determined either by the size, in terms of megabytes, or the age of the events. And what that means is it will keep a certain amount of data continuously in memory. And it will, it's a ring buffer, so it will just overwrite stuff, and it will drop any dead events. Now, both of these are unsatisfactory in, in, in different ways. The max age is unsatisfactory because you don't know how big it can get. Oh, I didn't mention things like some of these events involve things like allocation. So if you get a big spike of, of traffic, you get a big spike of allocation, you get a big spike of JFR events to do with allocation, and now you've blown the size of your container and your oom killer kicks in and your application dies. So you probably don't want to do that. On the other hand, if you set max size, you don't actually know how much data you're going to get in terms of time. Because again, under a big load spike, the time window for which you still have data is going to be compressed. So both of these are pretty bad. Um, in general, I tend to set the size and just set it a bit bigger than it needs to be and just, just not worry about the fact that I've got kind of ragged amounts of time that I can, I can go backwards. Oh, the other piece you need, of course, is this thing, J command. So J command can be used to control JFR from the command line. You get onto the box with the, um, with the JFR process, and you can start it, you can stop it, you can trigger a dump. There's a few other subcommands as well, but those are the main ones. OK, great. So if you have something as a ring buffer, this is, this is really handy. Um, because what it means is you can get onto the box, you can dump, start the recording at, at, at startup time, have it running in ring buffer configuration, SSH into the box, trigger a dump, you've got a file. And that file will enable you to go back in time. Because what it will dump is the contents of the ring buffer. And that could be the last 30 minutes, the last hour. If you size those things correctly, you can do this as an operations team. You can actually have the ability to dump recordings and actually see what was going on before an outage happened. So it's OK. Um, we've got some command line tooling here. We've got. Um, the J command, there's also the JFR command for working with dumps once we've got them. Um, anybody see any sort of slight problems with the architectural way that I've described this so far? No? Okay, you will very soon. So let's see if we can get a demo going. Okay. So. OK, right. I've just remembered that the, the thing about doing this demo is I actually need to change my monitor so that it's actually mirroring. OK, so. Oh. 
mirror. There we go. Mac OS has updated its mirroring configurations lately, and it's driving me crazy. I it's not where it's supposed to be. There we go. OK, so first things first, let's have a look at this uh, application I did earlier. This is a benchmark from Amazon. It's called Hi uh, uh, HyperAlloc, and it lives in the Hypothesis. Terrible pun of a name. Um, and what it's doing is it's basically stressing the, the memory subsystem here. Yeah, so we're just starting this up. There's my um, indications. I've given it a one gig heap. We've got started up a flight recorder. It's going to run for 60 seconds. It's going to output a file name at the end. And then we're just running the benchmark. Um, in general, um, I, wrote, I wrote a piece a little while ago, which is on Red Hat Developer. I'll put the link up later. Um, which talks about using uh, setting uh, constraints for, for containers. Um, so in this case, you know, the 30-second the, the version of what do you do with your containers is set XMX and don't bother with anything else. Uh, setting a minimum size is typically not a good idea, um, but there's more to that story. Okay. So that should be finishing any second now. There we go. And now I can just type JFR help. Uh, and it will show you this help screen, which basically says, I'm a tool for working with JFR. OK. So you can do things like print, which is the main usage that people, people use. Um, you can also do things like disassemble JFR files into smaller chunks, which is an interesting approach. Why that's relevant, I'll come back to you later. Um, but for now, I will, will simply talk about the, uh, the print target. And then it will so you can do other things like configuring to produce your own custom configs. Um, right, so let's stick with JFR print. You know, and you can just do this, and it will, will show you stuff. You can even do things like you can print this out in, in JSON format. So you can actually run it through other tooling, um, or XML if you're so inclined. Uh, so let's just do all right, and all of a sudden you get all this stuff because it turns out there's tons of information, even at the uh, at the basic level. So let's just just look at some of this. Okay, we've got JFR config. Actually, I can do that by highlighting so that I don't have to turn around and you can see what I'm talking about. I can actually make my mouse work. There we go. It's a configuration event. Okay, That tells us how our, our GC is configured. So we've got a young collector, which is G1. We've got an old collector, which is G1 old. There are concurrent threads of three in use and parallel threads of 10. Um, people know what the difference between concurrent and parallel means in GC, do they? Hands up if you know what the difference between concurrent and parallel is. Right, that's lots of hands not up. So let me explain. Um, it's confusing because in most cases, concurrent and parallel mean the same thing. Like in general concurrency, they mean the same thing. Uh, in garbage collection, they very much don't. A, they're actually kind of better to think of them as the opposite of two other terms. Okay? So a concurrent garbage collector, its opposite is a stop the world collector. Stop the world collectors own all the threads. Application threads can't run. Concurrent collectors run concurrently with your application threads. So they're sharing the CPUs with the application threads, and the world is not stopped. Um, parallel, its opposite, is single-threaded. Just means it has multiple, multiple threads doing the actual garbage collection work. It's one of the biggest um, things that people don't understand or, or get confused by in GC, so I figured it was worth telling people. Okay, so that's our garbage collection configuration. That's great. What else have we got in here? Oh, look, we've got a whole thing about code cache. Do you care about the JIT compiler? Well, here's some data about, about the, the code cache for you. You know, you, even down to addresses, you can see the start and the end address of the code cache. This is where the compiled machine code that comes out of the JIT compiler goes. What else have we got? Well, there's a whole bunch of other things. There's a whole bunch of things about modules. 
And there's just a ton of data here, right? So what we, might, what we might actually do is just have a look at this and just think, oh, actually, we don't want to have all of the events this time. Let's just take, uh, let's say, oh, let's just do all the GC events. Oh, this was on the default profile. That's right. Oh, that's annoying. Oh, it's categories, that's not events, is it? There we go. I wonder why that wasn't working. There we go, lots of GC events. See, now you can see we've actually got young collections. We've got... Do you want evacuation pause? So basically that's a new, a new pause where you just take a certain number of G1 regions and evacuate the objects out of them and so forth. Okay, so we can work with this. We, you know, we could, I think we can just say minus, is it just minus JSON? Yes, minus JSON. And so rather this sort of slightly weird format that JFR produces, you can just send it all out in one massive JSON document for, for, further, for further fun and games. Okay. So... So that's the, um, the command line. Um, we can start things, we can control them, we can look at the files that get dumped. <clears throat> By far and away, I think the most common usage of JFR that people may be familiar with is mission control. Uh, mission control is a graphical tool. Hands up if you use mission control or even started it once to have a play with. Yeah, there we go, a few people. Um, what you might have noticed about it <laughs> is that it has a, a distinct resemblance to an IDE of your acquaintance. It's totally built on the Eclipse toolkit. Yeah, pretty much from start to finish. It feels like an Eclipse application, and sure enough, it has OSGI embedded in it, even down to the parser level, which is rather unfortunate if you want to try to use the parser for anything else. Good luck with that. Um, so here is where we start to get some of the rough edges coming in for JFR. The files that are produced are dense and they're binary. They do have a sort of a chunk structure and you can break them apart into chunks uh, and that can be a useful approach. Um, but there is no official specification for the file format at all. And it changes between versions. So it, they, Oracle have stopped changing it as much as they once did. So it's relatively stable now, but there are new event types in each, each version of Java that come out and there have been some changes to the file format. Um, JMC uses its, its parser, and that's kind of the semi-official one, but it's difficult to, to separate out, and other parsers do exist. You did originally used to get this bundled with the Oracle JDK download. They no longer do that. If you want uh, JMC, you have to go and get it. So I'm going to do a very quick demo of JMC, just in case there are folks who haven't seen it uh, before. And I need to mirror. Okay, let's open a file up. Oh, let's find something which has got some problems. That's more fun. Uh, let's take one of the serial ones. So here we go. We have a, a bunch of this is this is a file that I that I, I generated playing with Hyperalloc with just one CPU. Because uh, did anyone go to Bruno's talk this morning? Yes. Okay. So Bruno's talking about about the serial GC and how that kicks in. Um, well, this this is an example of that because he and I've been talking about that that stuff for a while. Um, and let's just have a look at our overview screen. So this basically is showing you what's what's happening, and this this is kind of busy. So let me uh, let's put the allocation back. Um, and if I clear up some of this, you can kind of see that there is this this sort of jagged pattern here, um, and that's the sort of typical sawtooth pattern that you expect 
in Java applications because that, that's the sign of there are small minor collections, new collections, and then there is a, a bigger stop and a halt, w which is what these these red stripes are. They're the, the halts which show you whether the JVM has actually stopped um, for the old gen collections, which of course has stopped the world in the serial collector and indeed in parallel as well. And then, you know, you can look through this, you can find other stuff, you can find memory utilization. If you dive into that, you can, you can find things like the live object count. Um, and this is just from the benchmark. So uh, if some of this looks a little bit artificial, that's perhaps not super surprising. Um, this is quite a nice set of graphs. You see over here, you've got all of the, um, the specific event types that happen within GC. So this is like really low level detail. You know, we're, dr we're drilling down onto, well, the font's a bit blurry, but it says things like reconsider soft references, right? Very few people are actually gonna need to drill down to that level of detail as to what's actually going on. But should you need to, the data is there. Um, much more likely you're gonna be interested in this type of stuff. Basically we have here the longest pause and the sum of pauses showing you how long within each bucketed window the application was stopped for. Um, this level of data, by the way, is far superior to what you get out of JMX because JMX has the problem that it, it really suffers from lost update. If you, and you only get the last value that was ever seen, so stuff is frequently being overwritten um, and there's a lot of information loss in JMX versus actually dealing with the data as we see it in here. There's a bunch of other things you can do. You can, you can dive in into things like the, the allocation window, uh, which is not switched on for this dump, unfortunately. Um, there's JIT compilation um, and a bunch of other things as well. Okay, so you can you can do this. You know you can kind of work with these individual files, but here's where the architectural problem that I hinted at earlier comes into play. These are individual files from individual JVMs which cover specific time ranges. Um, that's not really much of an operational tool. Right. Do you want to be able to diagnose each problem that you have, you know, in the thousand JVMs you have by downloading files and loading them into a, a GUI, right? This is just not going to scale. So if you're doing performance analysis or you're doing some sort of, 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 of deep dive, which involves a human in the loop, sure, it can be a good tool. But a lot of times that's not what we need. What we need is something which is much more automated and much more at scale. Okay. So, let's come back to the slides. Oh, there's two other slides that I should just show you briefly. I didn't do them on the, in, in JMC itself. You can actually start and control JMC from, um, JFR from within JMC as well. But behind the scenes, it uses either the, um, the J command equivalent or JMX, depending on whether you're doing it locally or remotely, but it's the same trick in both cases. You know, and you can set it up to do very detailed profiling options, depending on what you've got. Okay, I've got 15 minutes, so I better speed up a bit. Uh, so if we're not gonna do that, logically we need to have some other way to handle stuff. Well, there's a programmatic API. JFR ships you an API for working with JFR files in the JDK.JFR module or equivalent packages in, in Java 8 if you're not modular yet. Notice that once again, this is not a java.star module. This is implementation dependent. This is all about hotspot. It's not part of the standard. It parses files and it can handle individual events, which is a step in the right direction, right? They're still having to deal with files and there's still one file per JVM, but at least you can get uh, individual events out of them. And from that, you can kind of handle the, the common JFR data types. To give you some idea, it's a very high level, this is how you do it, right? You have a file called, uh, a class called recording file, you grab your file from that, and then it's got an, it, uh, a method on it called has more events. So you just step through it, you take an event, you do something with it, you take a next event, right? It's just a while loop processing events as you go through the file. And then you have some way of looking at the event and deciding whether or not, usually by its name, whether or not you care about it because you take whatever data's there and then you just apply whatever you want to, uh, to get out of it. Uh, and let me show you that in action. So, 
So this is my JFR hacks where I play with this stuff. So how's that font size? Is that okay? Bigger? Okay. I've got thumbs up at the back. That'll do. So what are we doing in this code? Well, sure enough, you can see some of the same stuff I have here. Now I've got to try with resources loop um, uh, block. I'm going to create a registry handler, which basically there's one handler per file type, per event type, and then they get fired if they see an event that they, that they care about coming past. So very, very simple pattern here. We get the file, we step through it, and then we take everything which we've got in our registry, and we just stream through them, just looking for anything that we care about. Um, and that's it. If you find something you care about, then you pass off the event to it. You do, a, you do an accept on it, and away you go. Um, so then what this boils down to is that somewhere we have a, an interface called Recorded Event Handler. And then the idea behind this is that it is both a, uh, a predicate and a consumer. So at one and the same time, you, you see, you can, you can separately ask the questions, do I care about this, versus please do something with this. Um, and then in this, you know, you have a, just a default test method, which you use to determine whether you care about the event or not, which is, is this one of my, one of my events? Does it have the right name? Uh, and that's it. And there's a couple of other optional methods on there as well. Okay. So far, so good. Um, so yeah, and then there are different ones for different of the, the event types. Like, for example, you've got a CPU handler for looking at CPU load. There are some allocation handlers as well. And you can build the sort of, the, 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 the sort of programs you need to, to extract data out of this pretty simply from, from stuff like this. Okay. Uh, I'm also going to, rather than switching in and out here, let me also show you some analysis that I did here. So I haven't done showing the slides for this yet, but we can we can take a look at this as well. So this uses a um, a library called JFR Analytics, which was written by my my buddy and colleague uh, Gunnar Morling, who I don't think is here. Well, I hope he's not here because he should be speaking in the other room. Um, but assuming that he's not here, I'll just briefly plug his library. And this basically is, is something which is really quite cool because what it enables you to do is, well, I don't know if you can see this, but this is JDBC. It uses a library called Apache Calcite, and Apache Calcite enables you to provide an SQL abstraction over a data source. So what Gunnar's done is he's turned a JFR data file into something that I can write SQL about. So I have. Um, and notice, you might notice also that I've done some things like we're actually using some text blocks here. You know, there's, there's nothing but the best, nothing but, oh, private record. You know, the only, only the best Java 17 features uh, are for you folks. So here we go. So the first thing we've got to do is get the, get the config. We're going to get the collector. We're going to get the old collector, parallel GC threads, and the concurrent threads so that I know what I'm dealing with. Um, and we just write JDBC code. There it is. I get the things that I need. Um, and based on that, I can now, uh, what else happens? We get the config and we get the timings. And basically what I'm doing here is I've, I've, I've worked out a way to compare uh, G1 with parallel and other collectors, because it's it's a question about how do you fairly compensate G1 and parallel. Parallel has completely stopped the world. It's easy to figure out how much CPU time it uses. So if I want to calculate a number like the cost of doing GC per megabyte in terms of CPU time, right? How do you correctly compare those two collectors? One of them stopped the world and one of them isn't. The answer is in this code. So for the GC timings, you get back things like the elapsed duration, the total pause and the longest pause. That is all stop the world time. But G1, that under-reports, because G1 does stop the world. Um, it goes back to, to Dijkstra 
1978. Um, that paper shows that it's impossible to write, amongst other things, it shows it's impossible to write a completely pauseless version of, of, of GC. You, there must always be very slight pauses um, because you have to fix up the damage that you do while the concurrent threads are running. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what it shows. So the, the actual stop the world time for G1 is minuscule. Where does G1 spend most of its time when it's running in the old gen? In the concurrent phase. And in the concurrent phase, it's running alongside your application threads. It's stealing half the cores. So you have to account for that, for that time as well. So there's another bit of, of querying that I do in order to do that. Yeah, and then you just print it out. So what is this? This is 170-ish lines of code. And it basically pulls out all of the data that I need in order to, um, uh, to display my uh, outputted CSV files. And then the outputted CSV files. Am I, allowed to, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to show some Python code at a Java conference? Are people going to kill me? I hope not. But yeah, and then I've got this little JFR data plot class which actually does the work and puts it out and, as pandas and, and MATLAB. All right, how are we doing? About six minutes. Okay, not bad. Come back to some slides. So we talked about file parsing. We showed you how that was done. I talked about programmatic JFR and showing how you can, you can write code to analyze a JFR file just by writing some Java code. I introduced Java JFR analytics um, from, from Gunner, um, and that leads to this paper that I published on Red Hat Developer a few months ago. Um, so so the, the code that we were looking at, the Python code, is actually responsible for generating this graph. Um, you want to know what my conclusions are about um, what to do in single core containers and what happens, and starting to think about some of the efficiency of the garbage collectors relative to each other? Read the article. Did that one. And now we move into the final phase, because we start off and we have some command line tools, which is just all a bit hacky. Um, we move into a GUI tool, which is great, providing you only care about one JVM. We now have the ability to do th some things programmatically. So what's the obvious next step? It's to automate it. File handling is about single VMs. For monitoring, for observability, that's not what we want. And we, all, we don't want um, a single VM, and we don't want a file. What we want is a stream of telemetry data. So how are we going to get it? Well, there are four, count them, uh, 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 four different ways to do this. Um, I'll, you can do on-demand recordings, and you can upload them, and you can parse them, and you can treat that as, a, as an on-demand service. That's one of the things that we do at Red Hat in a product called Cryostat, um, which I didn't have time to get some screenshots for, but never mind. We can do what we did in New Relic, and still do, uh, which is to take the files and basically patch them back into a stream. I'll show you how we do that in a second. Um, but you create a pseudo stream out of many small recordings, is the answer. And then once you've got it into, into something which looks like a stream, it, you just send it into the telemetry input endpoint in the same way that you always would. Datadog do something different again, which is to take a JFR recording and to decompose it into chunks. And what they send up is a bunch of chunks, and everything is then handled server-side. The difference between those two approaches is that in, in the New Relic approach, the data is chopped up and in, into a form that you can actually do something with in open source code. In the Datadog case, it's done in proprietary code that you don't have access to. Um, but they're similar approaches. And then finally, you have JFR streaming. But unfortunately, that's JF, Java 17 only. And this slightly unusual group, I think, is probably ahead of the curve in terms of how many people are using Java 17 yet. Um, so, obligatory slide involving OpenShift, because I work at Red Hat. Um, but if you want to debug something like this, and to monitor and, and observe something like this, you need something which is fully automated. And three minutes for the final demo. Not bad. That one, and I thought to finish off with, I would show the um, 
the New Relic code, code base. So this was, was something I originally wrote for Java 14 when it first came out, but it's actually, um, it's actually what does work now with Java 11 as well. So just because folks are always curious about this, this is, this is the entry point. Um, it's a Java agent. So if, hands up if, if anyone's written a Java agent or knows broadly how they work. A few people. Okay, so there's a method called pre-main, which runs before main on the main thread. So actually you have to exit, because if you don't exit, your program never starts. Um, and pre-main, in this case, just runs this, what it calls real start. Um, this is just a piece of boilerplate, because you need to deal with the case where the agent is present at startup. Java agents are also possible to dynamically attach to running processes. Don't know if you knew that, not lots of people do. But in either case, you end up here. You do a couple of things. These are basically to confirm that the rest of this is going to run. Are the classes that I need actually here? And if they are, well, you just start. So now you have a file recorder factory, a controller, and an executor service. You pass this off into the, 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 the loop, and then the, the main thread exits, and the main application starts up. So the real action happens in these two classes, file recorder factory. Is this just not built yet? Oh, well, never mind. File recorder factory uh, and the controller. And then this, oh, this is an interface. Uh, okay, I see what the problem is. S for some unknown reason, it didn't mark that as a uh, as source. So here's the controller, um, and it's got two sending threads, just in case one of them blocks. Um, and essentially what happens is every 20 seconds, it triggers a new dump of the file, and it's got the last one in memory. So you overlap by 10 seconds each time, and you go chunk, chunk, and hand over hand, you end up with a complete set of all the events. And then you just deduplicate, turn it into a stream, transform it into the, the new relic uh, open format, and send it up. Um, and then the actual uh, mappers follow the same um, pattern that we saw earlier on, where basically there are, there are different handlers for different event types. Okay, so that's, that's basically how it's done uh, in the new relic solution. So, conclusions. There's a pseudo stream. You can do it one of the other ways I talked about. The future is JFR continues to evolve. There are new event types, including things like detecting value-based classes. Things, so basically, you can use JFR to predict whether or not you have to re-architect for Valhalla. Right? If you switch that JFR event on, it will tell you. It's totally possible to do that. I'm interested in JFR because it's low-level performance, because it has very good data, uh, and also as an observability source. Um, it's a major new area of interest. The, the fact that the JFR profiler is really good is, is specifically interesting because the open telemetry standards and working groups are about to start looking at profiling uh, as an always-on technology, which would be a significant step forward for a lot of applications. And the Datadog profiler that was contributed back into JFR uh, is a great example of how that work might go. There's also Java 17, JFR streaming. That could simplify the architecture for a lot of these tools as well. Um, that's something that I'm specifically looking at, building a bridge between um, JFR streaming in 17 um, and, um, uh, and open telemetry. Uh, this plays into the what's called three pillars of observability, metrics, logs, and traces. Metrics and logs are very much interesting to, uh, to the sorts of data that you could, you could get out of JFR. If you want to hear more about that, come along on Wednesday. Uh, some conclusions, which I think I've talked to all of now. Um, it's a very interesting and open area, which is actively being developed in open source, but, uh, upstream by, by Red Hat and uh, many other companies as well. Uh, hope to see people on Wednesday. And finally, this is the new book that's coming out um, anytime, anytime now. If you want to take a, a picture of this page, it comes with a discount code. So that will get you 35% off the book and literally anything else on the Manning site. So 
Um, I think we should go to questions. We have probably we're at the end of the session, so we could we could take a couple. Does anybody have any questions? Surely there's one or two people. Yes, yes, over there. Could we could, could we get a mic over there? Is there one that you show the uh, the slide with the with the GitHub? Oh, which one? Uh, that, that one. That one. Okay. That wasn't the question, but I think that that, that, that that's fine. Yeah, that's good. Um, anybody else? No. Okay. Thanks, folks. <laughs>